the Le Mans 24 Hours started in 1923. It is just the greatest race of its kind. It draws the most enormous crowd. And of course, the circuit itself is excellent. To drive a quick car at Le Mans, it's not like anywhere else. It's just so fast. It's a very old event, isn't it, as well? It's been going for years and years, and just the name Le Mans means a lot to people. And it certainly means a lot to go there and race. It hasn't changed, I suppose, really dramatically. Um, there's still the great corners in there to drive around. It's just the most challenging place to get somebody to say, OK, go and have a go now, see how fast you can go in qualifying. It's one of the best handling cars I've ever driven. It was incredibly stiff, the, the chassis, and it just handled absolutely beautifully. When it came to the rain, the car was incredible. I don't remember ever having a moment in it. I mean, it was just so beautifully balanced. It only had 330, 40 horsepower, so when you came out of the corner with the grip and the tires, it was just a perfect package for that one race. Been involved with it for so long, it's wonderful to me personally, but for the whole world, it just stands out as obviously the big race of its kind, head and shoulders above any other. A couple of years after I joined Porsche, several years ago now, I was invited to go out to Germany on a programme called Introduction to Porsche, where we got to see the museum and so on and so on. At the end of the trip, our Porsche colleagues tried to give every, um, every delegate from around the world a model sporting the flag of their country. So, so I was given this model of a, of a 924, you know, carrying the, the Union Jack. And uh, I remember looking at the time and um, not really realising that the reason they gave me that model was that was the only car ever that carried the Union Jack and therefore there was no other model they could give me. And it sat on my shelf in, in my office for, for quite a long time until we realised we were coming around to the, the 40th anniversary of the launch of the 924 back in 1976. We were wondering how to really celebrate that milestone and get engaged with it and I, and I suddenly remembered this model on my shelf and I started to wonder where is this car, you know, what, what happened to it, where, where is it now, what, what condition is it in, can we get hold of it? Until 76 they only had the 911 model which was rear engine, air cooled and all the customers of course were steeped in 911 and then the 924 came along, water cooled, front engine, transaxle, quite a new design, completely new in every way and I think the purists thought it's not a proper Porsche, it's you know like what is it? Then PR man Mike Cotton came up with the idea of a one-off championship for just one year. In order to promote the 924, still then a new model, we decided to run a Porsche 924 racing championship in 1978. It was very, very close all the way. I think I only had pole position once in the whole year, but uh, I won two-thirds of the races outright, and Andy was second. We went off and did the Commander's Cup, which was the British speed and endurance record on British soil. And we took the record with the 94, that was in 79. You know, we'd already done a 24 hour event with the Porsche 924. So we knew we could trust each other. You probably couldn't have chosen a better couple of guys to get the car to the finish. Then I went to the Frankfurt show in uh, September 79, and there the Carrera GT was presented. And the stylist, Tony Lapin, said to me, we're going to run three cars at Le Mans next year. And I went back to Reading to my boss, John Aldington, and said, do you think we could sponsor one and put Tony John and Andy Rouse in it? And he said, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to do that. What they said to me was, can you get a name? So I thought, well, I might be able to. And I rang Derek Bell and said, what do you think? He rang me back almost the next day and said, I, I've talked to Bob and I've thought about it. Yes, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. 
And the next thing I knew, they were going to run three cars, going to be a German car with Jürgen Bart, British car for our two drivers, and an American car for Al Holbert and Peter Gregg. And suddenly it was all taking off. When we went to Le Mans in June 1980, Peter Gregg had quite a bad road accident on his way to the briefing. He hit somebody and the team doctor examined him and said, you're out, you, you know, you can't drive. And then they said, well, can Derek drive with Al Holbert in the American car? So they said, would I step out of the British car and drive with Al Holbert, which for me was fantastic because I then raced for Al Holbert almost from thereafter for about six years during the 80s and winning the American Championship, what, three or four or five times between us. We worked out who we needed to talk to and we made some inquiries and discovered that indeed the car did still exist. It was around and it was, uh, it was kind of gathering dust in a cage in Germany. So we decided we would unveil the car to the press and to the drivers. It was just so exciting, such a proud moment and moments like that that you'll remember forever really. Well, first of all, I, I didn't expect to see the car again, having stepped out of it in 1980. I was amazed to be invited to the Porsche Experience Centre for that press launch that day, because I really never thought I'd see this car again. It had disappeared. I'd heard some fraudster in Spain claimed he'd got it, but I knew it was hidden away in the depths of some vault in Stuttgart. Porsche history is very important. Uh, it's the core of the Porsche brand and uh, you have to take good care of your history and uh, without history you have no future. We have a secret storage facility where we store all the cars which we do not have on display and uh, which we don't sell around the world at the moment. The 924 uh, GTP is an iconic race car from the early 1980s, was a Le Mans participant with a, with a pretty good result and it's a quite iconic car because uh, it shows how close motorsports and production are at, at Porsche. When we saw the car we realised something must have happened to it post the race at Le Mans. Uh, there were clearly some modifications had been done to the car, there were items missing on the car and uh, clearly it had been elsewhere and used for other things after the race. It's what we call a sleeping beauty. And you can see uh, many marks, little damages uh, at the car. It's completely unrestored and um, it's like a time capsule. The restoration of a classic race car is always a big challenge because um, the cars are unique, they're prototypes, they're one of a kind. So you cannot just go to the warehouse and, and pick some, some parts. But uh, I think if you have a lot of passion to detail, the result will be, will be amazing. And it was then that I, I had the idea that wouldn't it be amazing if we could persuade the, the museum to give it up, let the car come back to, to Britain and, uh, and give us the chance to really show what we could do. I think the first time I saw it, it was a case of there's a lot of work to do on this, there's a lot missing. It built up a bit of a, yeah, it can be done, but this isn't a, the work of a moment. Race cars, by nature of the beast, they are development mules. They, they get little bits and pieces put on them all the time to try and make them more reliable and make them faster. The drivers came to see us at the launch and they were quite sort of surprised that it's not as it finished Le Mans, and they were sort of saying, well, it, we, we brought it back home and it was in one piece and hardly a mark on it. The car is just a one-off. It wasn't made in, in any significant series numbers, so a lot of bespoke and hand-detailed items on the car. We needed to get the car stripped as quickly as possible so that we would be able to analyse what we had 
what we didn't have. And of course that's the biggest risk to any project like that, that you just don't know the extent of that. The museum, they have lots of spare parts that we've said we can look through and once we've identified what's missing then we can look through their list of spare parts. If they haven't got it then we're just going to have to either make it or uh, try and source it from somewhere else. So once the car was, uh, was into pieces, the aim was to distribute the various parts of the car to the classic partners. So we have Porsche Centre Swindon who have a big job in restoring the engine. Hatfield have got the gearbox, the plumbing and the wiring which and, and the rebuild area is going to be at Leeds. That's a big job in itself and then the suspension is, is up in Glasgow so it's a case of we have to coordinate all these various individual projects for the same car to be happening at the same time. This would enable us to get lots of people involved in the car but it would also enable us to do the car within quite a, a tight time frame. We're hoping to do it in six months um, so for a restoration that's an incredibly tight time frame. Having said that, when Norbert Singer was given the, the go-ahead to produce these cars, he was given seven months to produce them from scratch. So once the car was stripped, off it went with its various technicians uh, to the four corners of the country. Uh, and I, I am really grateful to the collaboration all the guys showed, making sure that the, the things they were doing on their individual parts was the right thing for the, for the project as a whole. We talked a lot about how to present the car. The view was this is, this is really a time capsule and so the decision was taken that that was the right way to present the car just as it would have arrived at Le Mans in 1980 ready to go. Race cars have got, they call it patina, um, the originality if you will. So one of the hardest challenges, talking of challenges, is going to get that patina back and get that sympathetic restoration back to being a race car rather than a, a show car. We'll try and keep again the materials that are being used exactly the same as the materials that were used in 1980. We have the full fiberglass front clamshell. That actually has been modified. They've actually moved the air intakes for the brakes further out. We've got to cut this out, bring the air intakes for the brakes further in and also narrow the air intake to make it look as it was original when it raised up the mall. I mean, the, deciphering the drawings was, was quite a challenge because we had them sent over and they were scanned. Uh, so we haven't got the original drawings. We've got parts of drawings on different images. So we've had to print those off and try and decipher which bit goes on where and, and make a collage out of it, basically. The box that we're making for the fuel cell, uh, we've noticed from pictures we've received, uh, it's quite a yellow fiberglass and it's made out of a woven fabric as well. So we've managed to research this and we've got a company who's actually made some resin, which is the old type of resin, which will have the yellow appearance. And we've actually got, uh, found some of the woven material for the fiberglass, which will give us a, the original appearance. The difference between restoring a road car and a race car is that a lot of the time these cars were made from scratch. You know, they're bespoke items. They weren't built off a plan, so trying to track down original drawings or plans is very, very difficult. It's finding these bespoke parts which Porsche use. They use the best that they could find. It's beautifully machined, beautifully made, typically Porsche, function over form. Um, built for lightweight, built for longevity, um, typically beautifully engineered. 
There are, there are parts on the car which we're going to struggle to get, there's no question about that. Um, things like the instruments, a lot of the instruments were missing out of the car. We've managed to locate a couple and the Americans generally tend to collect those parts rather than throw them away and they've always sort of been interested in, in history. There are certain items where it's not being manufactured now, so we've got to make the decision as to whether we machine these parts up and get them machined, um, things like the, the, the oil pump, the water pump, um, or whether we spend more time trying to locate various items for it. So yeah, it's, uh, there are some challenges. When we studied the car carefully after it had arrived to discover that the engine we had probably wasn't the original engine and we would probably have to be a bit creative to try and work out how to get the car running as it would have been in 1980 when we knew deep down that the engine we were working with wasn't, uh, wasn't the original. I could not believe my eyes one day I was sat at my desk and an email came in from, uh, from the head of the Porsche Museum to say he'd been contacted by a gentleman in the, in the Czech Republic who was a well-known collector of um, transaxle race, racing cars who claimed to have the original engine. I could not believe it. The engine in our car is from a later development and it would be lovely for us to be able to put that original number two car back to its original specification. And this is a perfect opportunity. It was quite nerve-wracking in a way, like, of course, not knowing whether when we got the engine back, you know, it is, how easy is it going to be to marry this engine up to all the pipe work and so on. Exchanging various parts, it means that we will be missing some parts and have to manufacture some parts at Porsche GB. It does put us back a little bit obviously because we have to do some more work. There's some more fabrication to do. We don't have any water pipes with this engine. We don't have the intercooler top. So there's quite a, a lot of fabrication which is now going to have to be done. Despite all of that, it's definitely worth it to know that the engine is, is probably the engine that it deserved to have in and would have had in right, right from the start. That's, that's really exciting. While all the Porsche sensors were restoring their individual components, the guys at Road and Race had a, had a job on to really make sure that the work to the body uh, were, were done. And uh, it was really lovely that kind of everybody working together, even though they were remote, everything kind of uh, came together. I couldn't have asked for a better turn of fate, really, that everything came together at the right time and the car could uh, go in to be painted, knowing that when it came out, everything would be ready hopefully to start gradually building the car back up again. When we're repainting the car, we need to ensure that it's a very light amount of paint, so we can't build it up with primers and, and then flat it back and rebuild it up with, with more and more colour. We need to keep it very light as the cars were, were built in the day. It's, it's all different little bits and pieces which come together to try and make this car as original as possible. The wheels have been taken away, they've been fully restored and we've now got the replacement tyres as well. The technicians from Glasgow, they originally took all the suspension items off, the braking items, they took that away, they then restored those components back up in Scotland and then what they've done today is come back down to fit it back to the vehicle. And the 924 in itself is really invigorated. 
our view of classic and the way that we look at it. It's taking something that looks sorry, a little bit broken down, a bit unloved, and just bringing it back to life. I can't wait to see the car come together. I mean, we've got it partly rebuilt at the minute, and you can already see it taking shape. The project for me, it, it means a lot. I am extremely proud to, to be given the honour to, to be able to restore this historic race car for the Porsche Museum. To see the car back and running, doing a lap around a circuit would be fantastic. Um, it's a real honour for us to work on the car. Um, and for me personally, it would be a real moment to see it come alive again. For me, it's always a highlight if I can see a classic Porsche race car which was restored because then the car it's going back to life. The cars were built for driving and that's what they should do. This project has really surpassed our expectations in how much energy and excitement it's generated, the interest. I'm really proud because I, I think it will, it will do exactly what we wanted to do at the outset, which is to really show the passion that exists amongst the Porsche team, the integrity, the care, the, the technical competence that the guys have got. And, and why you know it's right that Porsche has all those credentials within its network.